Today's message, we are taking a detour from moving our way through Luke's gospel. We are, God willing, my initial plan is to return to Luke's gospel next Sunday. But given everything that has happened since Saturday before last and last Sunday through this past week, our sermon today is Gaza's captive, God's salvation. Gaza's captive, God's salvation. And the initial question that actually reverberates and repeats itself from different angles over and over again right now is, what's happening? What is happening? First of all, of course, we deal with the surprise attack and invasion that happened Saturday before last and Sunday uh, by Hamas militants, uh, the Hamas uh, terrorist army invading, damaging, and destroying Israeli military post and outpost all in the southern area, Negev area near Gaza, the various, the Erev crossing, uh, the Karam Shalom crossing and other places, uh, going specifically into kibbutz, kibbutzim and, and other, some towns uh, that are relatively near Gaza and specifically methodically after initial shelling and uh, attack from the air, uh, massacring, raping, killing folks, killing babies, uh, carrying grandmothers into captivity. And as we now know what has come to light, by the way, what is happening, uh, we know that this was all extensively and with great detail planned over a number of months and even uh, began in the planning process two years ago. I don't know if you watch or catch Russian uh, state-sponsored TV from Russia, but of course, one of the leaders of Hamas was a star on Russian TV last Sunday talking uh, jovially about how uh, the Hamas had been able to uh, distract Israeli and U.S. intelligence, and we thought they were just kind of governing uh, Gaza, but they didn't realize this was going to come and hit them and was just rejoicing at how successful this was, that so many more were killed uh, and taken hostage than even their wildest dreams expected from uh, from the Hamas leaders. Uh, I've been in contact, as I mentioned, with Daryl Fenton, our friend, my friend, and our mission partner with CMJ in Israel a number of times over the last uh, nine or so days, and I had a good conversation with Daryl on our Friday morning, his early Friday evening or Friday afternoon heading into Shabbat. He said that a number of folks had been at Christ Church there, you know, which is right there in the middle of Jerusalem where I preached in May uh, for uh, prayers before Shabbat uh, that afternoon, on Friday afternoon. Daryl told me about the mission station there in, right there in the heart of Jerusalem as well as in Jaffa and Tel Aviv and up at Migdal on the Galilee are being transitioned into mission centers for Israeli um, refugees who've lost their homes from the south or who have been forced to leave because of the impending war. What is going on? Daryl, uh, I'll come back to what he said further, but what's happening? Well, let's just pull out and again, it's been really disturbing and shocking to see the detailed instructions that have now come to light from Hamas uh, folks who've been captured or killed in the last week with just detailed um, uh, maps of kibbutzim, this is, we're going to go ahead and shell first all the instructions, then the people will go into the bomb shelters, and when you arrive, you're going to cut through uh, the fence, and you're going to go in, and here's where they'll be, and you'll be able to have maximum casualties and maximum uh, hostages if you first take out this, uh, this machine gun, and then you move in this direction. All the details, I mean, everything mapped out. It's incredible how detailed this information was. Nothing like this ever before from Hamas. And clearly, there were higher level folks involved in this. And the fact that this could be kept underground without any social media or uh, cell phone communication for months is staggering and uh, pretty overwhelming just to begin to uh, comprehend. But as, as Iran and Russia and th that axis of power was celebrating this past week, it was really pulled off beyond belief. But of course, if we're going to talk about Hamas, we have to talk about Hezbollah, so the big brother, which is much more powerful up in Lebanon uh, than Hamas, with mid-range uh, tactical missiles all over the place, much more uh, 
uh, in place than Hamas, and we've got to be praying about that whole situation with do we end up with a war on two or more fronts in Israel? Does it escalate into an entire Middle Eastern war and then into World War III, and then something that has to do with the closing chapters of Revelation? You know, what are we, what are we talking about here? Ooh, it's, it's a lot. What is happening? From a broader perspective, when you start talking about the, uh, the Tehran and Iranian axis with Russia, um, and you start talking about the Islamic Republic of Iran, we and I recall the words of Bernard Lewis, the, probably the most insightful Western analyst of Middle Eastern affairs and Islamist thought of the last, you know, last 40 years. He's dead now, but he taught at Princeton for a number of years, British scholar. And he said back about 15 years ago, he said that the threat of mutual assured destruction, which was a default deterrent, a guaranteed deterrent during the Cold War between the US and the former Soviet Union, prevented wars escalating in a nuclear war, that mutual assured destruction for the Islamic Republic of Iran would not be a deterrent, but instead an inducement for conflict. Because under the Islamist way of thinking, whether you're talking about Shia, like Iran, or Sunni, like much of the rest of the, well, the Arab world, mutual assured destruction would be an inducement if you believe that jihad is the pathway to eternal bliss and the destruction, the mass destruction of the infidel underlines jihad and is the purpose of jihad, then what's to stop you? Uh, to just try to get your head around that and understand where we are uh, is it's way above my pay grade. What is happening? Well, right now, for the time being, as you may know, Gaza City is the center of gravity. Gaza City is the center of gravity. We'll be paying a lot of attention to Gaza City in the coming days, but you need to understand it may expand way out from Gaza City. But given all that, in the last week, I've been reflecting on Gaza. You probably have, too. And, uh, you know, just turning back to scripture that pertains not to present Gaza, but ancient Gaza. There is, of course, the physical geographical connection. Current Gaza city is built atop the ancient Philistine city of Gaza. Remember that the Philistines have a pentapolis uh, 3,200 years ago with five major cities, Ashkelon, Ashtar, Gat, um, and, 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 and the, the most important city for these sea peoples was, of course, Gaza. I'm going to read some scripture, and then we'll pull back to it and ask the question again. What is happening? So what is happening in this story? Judges chapter 16, verses 20 and 21. And she, this would be a woman named Delilah. You may have heard of Delilah. She said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. He's all bound right now. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. Yes, Gaza. And bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. God's captive, Gaza's captive, and God's salvation. Well, let's pull back and read some scripture. We, uh, I'm not planning on doing a three or four Sunday series on Samson and the multiple chapters dealing with Samson and Judges, but we'll try to sweep through. I'm going to try to sweep through because I've been thinking about and reading through these chapters in the last week. Judges chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, the beginning of the Samson story. And then moving way ahead to Judges chapter 16, the final chapter. And the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. 
Now there was a certain man of Zorah, of the tribe of Dan, whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And an angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, please be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Then the story, the final chapter, literally in the way the Bible is marked out, of Samson, picking up at verse 1 of chapter 16. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went into her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the city gate. They kept quiet all night, saying, Let us wait until the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts. Now this is massive. This is like standing in the front of our church and hauling it out. Um, and pull them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carry them to the top of the hill that is at the front of Hebron. He goes a long way with the city gates. And after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorak, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines, that's a term that's used specifically for the leaders of the Philistines. It's a... It's a It's a particular term in the Hebrew. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and said, Seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, 1,100 pieces of silver by itself, one dose of that, makes you incredibly wealthy. And we're talking about all the lords, each of them giving her this massive amount of money. Fast forward, uh, three times Samson gives an answer to her about his strength that turns out not to be the case. He breaks free from bondage a number of times and all these times. And so now we get to verse 15. And she, Delilah, said to him, how can you say I love you? when your heart is not with me. This three times you have mocked me and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart and said to her, a razor has never come upon my head for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he told her all his heart, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines and said, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came to her and brought the money in their hands. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees, and she called to a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Now, the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and rejoice. And they said, 
Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, that means when they became drunk, they said, call Samson, that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, remember he's blind, let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, the temple, the, the temple, that I may lean against them. And now the house, the temple, was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, and on the roof, overlooking, kind of in the seating overlooking the temple, there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may with one blow be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the, the temple the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and his left hand on the other. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Then his brothers and all his family came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah, his father. He had judged Israel 20 years. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. If you've read through the book of Judges, and particularly as you move into the second half of the book of Judges, you know the building refrain that develops is this. It's like what Judges 21-25 says to close off the book, to pretty much wrap up the book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever was right in his own eyes. You like individualism? You're a good modern Westerner? You like individualism? Hey, this was like heaven on earth, only it was hell on earth. So <laughs> individualism run rampant, free from God free from kingly rule. Everybody does what's right in his own eyes, what's right in her own eyes. Lots of building politics of anger. You see this running all through judges, everybody recrimination against everybody else. People going on cable news all the time, bad mouthing each other 3,200 years ago, whatever kind of cable news they had. You know, and people getting riled up all the time. Uh, that's just what it was like. Ever escalating crime, terror, and wars. Ultimately, chaos, or maybe I should say penultimately chaos, because ultimately you're talking about hell on earth. And Judges chapter 2, verse 15, tells us early on the story, the incomplete you know, conquest and establishment in the promised land, the, the unfaithfulness. The, whenever they marched out, the Israelites, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm. As the Lord had warned them, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up judges. Now, these are not people sitting on benches just kind of having nice little, you know, judicial discussions. These are warrior savior type people. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. But, verse 17, yet they, the Israelites, did not listen to their judges. For they, this is the Bible now, this is not Martin, this is the Bible. For they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. So let's move on to the story of Samson. Samson is the last judge in the book of Judges. We're going to get another judge named Samuel in 1 Samuel. But Samson is. we got a whole bunch of chapters to go in Judges. Samson is the last judge that God raises up 
for the people of Israel. Then it just gets, it goes from really bad to really worse. It's the longest account, this account of Samson in all the book of Judges. Longest account. Uh, the most lascivious. This is just the most, you know, strangest. And we get this paradox, this paradox of Samson being the strongest, yet the weakest. Samson the strongest, yet the weakest. Physically strong in fighting Philistine men, but morally weak in seeing and chasing after, romancing Philistine women. Samson is the poster child of what God's word says is the sourcing of our sin in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So he's the last judge in the book, the longest account, most lascivious, and yet we get an angelic annunciation of his birth. The only angelic annunciation of a birth, now we get the calling to Gideon, but here we get an angelic annunciation of a miracle birth. It's the only one in the book of Judges foretelling for a barren woman, we're supposed to pay attention to that, that's a big deal in the Old Testament, to a barren woman, a miraculous conception and birth. The Israelites, again, did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Judges 13, 1. So the Lord gave them into the Philistines' hands 40 years. Now, as you read through the book of Judges, you can infer this. The Philistines are actually especially dangerous. Not because they are as brutal. They're not as brutal as the Amorites, the Midianites, the king from, um, from Mesopotamia that you're dealing with early in the book of Judges. They're most dangerous because they are attractive as oppressors. They are the beautiful people. They're the beautiful people. They're much more sophisticated than the Israelites. If there were actual movies back then, the Philistine women would be the stars. They'd be the people on social media influencing our kids right now. <laughs> they're, they're the beautiful people. They're the smart people. They're the sophisticated people. They're more culturally advanced as oppressors than the other folks you're dealing with in Judges. And because of that, there's an attraction to being subject to them, to let them rule over you. When you get to Judges chapter 15, there's this striking situation where the people of Judah, who are supposed to be the leading warriors of the Israelites, from Judah will come the king, okay? The Judahites, say to Samson, why are you causing all this problem? We are under the Philistines. We don't want problems with them. Just like many of the Jewish leaders to Jesus say, why are you causing problem with the Romans? We're under them. We don't want trouble. So the Judites say that also. Judges 15 verse 11, then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Atom and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? In other words, the Judahites have accepted the Philistine rule. And in fact, what they do, I can tell you there's two situations where um, Samson actually prays to God because he's in a situation of being captured by the Philistines. This is the first one, the second one we're looking at in chapter 16. The Judahites also betray Samson over to the Philistines. They tie him up. He lets them tie him up because he says, are you going to kill me? And they say no. So he knows he's got this situation under control. He'll be able to break free of whatever bondage and kill the Philistines. But the Judahites are sitting there telling Samson, we don't want trouble. We want to be. We're, we've accepted being subject to uh, the Philistines. Have you ever accepted being subject to the Philistines? Possibly. How are you living? Faithfully? In bold defense against the Philistines? Or, hey, they're the beautiful people. They're in charge. We just kind of go along with them. Well, 
Uh, one of the things that I would also note to you is that back to Judges 13, verse 1. The Lord gave the Israelites over to the Philistines' hand 40 years. And you keep reading in verses 2 and 3, and what is missing? If you've been reading Judges up until now, you know the way this works. After years of subjection and oppression, the Israelites always cry out to the Lord, and the Lord raises up a judge to deliver them. Guess what doesn't happen this time? We're silent, crickets, on the Israelites crying to the Lord. No one is interested in having deliverance from God over the Philistines. But God, in his sovereign intervention, gives them a judge anyway. And it's through this miraculous birth of this son of Manoah's barren wife. See, every time, like in Judges 3, 9, also in 4, 3, in chapter 6, verse 7, in chapter 10, verse 10, the Israelites cry out to the Lord. They don't cry out this time. They pretty much accepted everything. But God has plans for conflict with the Philistines. So we get the angelic annunciation to Manoah, to Manoah's barren wife, and she shares it with Manoah of this conception and this set-apart child. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to, catch that, he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now notice this, the call and the choosing of Samson is before his birth. He is placed under Nazarite vows before he even exists. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Under the law and under the Old Testament, a man is supposed to choose for a season to be under Nazarite vows. And then he can come out of them when, when that season of special ministry is over. In this case, this son is being chosen before birth to be under Nazarite vows. Does Samson have any choice in this? <laughs> no. no, God is taking over at this point. Kind of looks ahead to John the Baptist and his story. Okay, so God elects, sets him apart, giving him holy vows and a Savior's call. And then we deal with Samson's spirit-endued strength but sinful sight. He's really strong, but he has bad eyes. Jesus says the eyes are the big deal with people. That's, you know, you, you deal with light and darkness through the eyes. And so we come to this statement that Samson makes. She is right in my eyes. I don't care what God says. I want this Midianite for my wife. That's what he says, excuse me, this, this Philistine for my wife. She is right in my eyes, this Philistine woman from Timnah. She's right in my eyes. So his first wife is a Philistine from Timnah. And his parents, Samson's parents, are aghast at this. And they say, isn't there somebody from Israel that you can choose? And then we get this really striking verse in Judges chapter 4, verse 4. His father and mother did not know that it was from the Lord for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. So God is starting a fight with the Philistines through Samson's sinful decision to go after a Philistine wife. That's Judges chapter 14, verse 4. Well, you get this, she's right in my eyes also with the prostitute in Gaza. That's our first time down to Gaza. And then also with Delilah. We don't know if Delilah is a Philistine or not. We're not told. She could just be, she could be binational. We don't know. She could be a compromised Israelite, and they are offering her a whole lot of money. Notice she's not in Gaza. She's not anywhere near Gaza, and they need to pay her off big time to have her betray Israel's, you know, low-level savior here, Samson. So we're dealing with, and we're being taught about human freedom and human sight. Round one, Judges 16, verse 1, Samson freely goes to Gaza to see a prostitute. That's Judges 16, verse 1. Now then, pick up the contrast at Judges chapter 16, verse 21. Human freedom and seeing no more. Shackled Samson, this is not his choice, he's not going to see a prostitute out of his own sight. Shackled Samson is brought down to Gaza blind. 
he doesn't see physically anymore. Judges 16, verse 4 and verse 18, human freedom and human heart. Samson loves Delilah with all his heart and tells all his heart to Delilah. Under the Shema, we're supposed to give all our heart to Delilah? No, to the Lord our God. And let me tell you, this is not just about Samson. If you give all your heart to a man or a woman in your life, to a child in your life, as much as you're supposed to love your family and your children, I can tell you this, if you're giving your whole heart to them over God, we've got major problems. Samson gives his whole heart to Delilah. Puts everything at jeopardy. Kudos to Barry Webb and his commentary. It's brilliant insight. It's basic and brilliant. Samson was Israel. Now, Webb doesn't explore this first way, I'm going to tell you. Samson is Israel because he is the representative warrior. As I told you, Israel and even the Judites don't want a war with, Philist with the Philistines. So God uses one man to fight the entire nation of the Philistines. Okay? But then what Webb points out is, in his commentaries, Samson was Israel. He's set apart for the Lord, but he's resistant to the calling of the Lord, waywardly chasing after the world. That's Samson, and that represents Israel. Israel rejects its calling. Israel was chosen by God. Israel didn't do anything to get the choosing. God chose Israel. This pertains to you and me as Christians in the church also. We believe, and the Bible tells us, that you were saved by God, not that you saved yourself. God called you. Are you living consistently with that action, that grace of God in your calling? Or are you resisting it and chasing after the world? Where are your eyes? Where are your desires? As Israel went after foreign gods, Samson chased foreign women, even prostitutes. And he only prayed in desperation. Judges chapter 16, verses 23 through 31, we're dealing with divine sovereignty, heart, and sight. Divine sovereignty, God's heart, and sight. Boy, we need God's heart and God's sight because we sure don't see and our hearts sure are deceiving. Here's what Samson says. I will go out as other times and shake myself free, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God that I may, with one blow, be avenged on the Philistines from my two eyes. Samson also either prayed this or just says this. We don't know what it is. Let me die with the Philistines. And then, of course, he takes out the whole temple and all the surrounding audience. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. Remember, step up parallelism. I emphasize this in Luke chapters 1, 2, and 3 with John the Baptist, step up parallelism to Jesus. Remember that? Okay, let's walk through what's going on here, bigger picture, as far as the Bible. You have Manoah's barren wife. She gives birth through miracle to a guy named Samson. Samson is the forerunner of no king. There is no king in Israel in those days. And he only begins the salvation from the Philistines. Well, if you have a brain as a reader of the scripture, you're asking, okay, there is no king. Is there going to be another forerunner of an actual king? And Samson's only beginning deliverance from the Philistines. Who's going to complete it? You have to be asking those questions when you read the Bible. Well, let's step up. We have then, at the beginning of 1 Samuel, the barren Hannah. She gives birth to a boy named Samuel. 
Samuel is the forerunner of and the anointer of a guy named King David. And King David completes the deliverance from the Philistines. 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 1. Well, let's step up some more. Let's get to the New Testament. I've already mentioned her. You have Baron Elizabeth, son of a priest named Zechariah. Luke chapter 1. Baron Elizabeth, through the miracle of God, gives birth to a son named John, John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the forerunner of someone named Jesus. And Jesus completes salvation from sin and Satan. The reason the Son of God appeared, 1 John chapter 3 tells us, was to do what? Why did Jesus come? To destroy the works of the devil. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. But how? How did Jesus do that? Jesus says in the great crisis, as he's before Pontius Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting so that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. He's already told Simon Peter, those who live by the sword die by the sword. This is a different kind of warrior. This is a different kind of judge, totally beyond what we're talking about with Samson or even David. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. Put on the whole armor of God to withstand the devil's schemes. The armor of God is not an AK-47. It is, you know, includes the sword of the spirit, which is what? A big weapon? It's the word of God. The gospel. Jesus, our savior, our warrior, came to destroy the devil's works. How did he do it? Samson says in Judges 15:11. He tells the Judites, as they did to me, so I have done to them. They gave it to me, I give it back harder to them. That's Samson. You want Samson as your savior, you're in trouble. Jesus says, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist the one who is evil, turn the other cheek. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. How are we going to be saved through that, you might ask, in your flesh? Samson says, Lord, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once that I may with one blow be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Let me die with the Philistines. God's word says that vengeance belongs to you and me, to Samson. No, vengeance belongs to the Lord. How does Jesus pray? You know, Samson has his hands stretched out saying, please let me kill them all. Jesus has his hands stretched out and what does he say? Please let me die alone to save all those who belong to you. You see how radically different Jesus is. Jesus, with his hands stretched out on the cross, prays what? Let them all die with me. Take them all out. They have offended the Lord's anointed. No, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So let's try to manage Romans 13, which says, and I am under this word and support this word with respect to Israel right now, my friends there. Be subject to governing authorities, for he does not carry the sword in vain, for he is the Lord's servant, God's servant, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. But for us, internally, and how we are in our spiritual life and as the church, Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Do not be overcome by evil, verse 21, but overcome evil with good. As kind of a break from all the news last Sunday night, Nancy turned on this movie, A Greater. It's a Christian movie about uh, Brandon Burlesworth, who played walked on at Arkansas and became an All-American, tragically killed after being drafted by the Indianapolis Colts. He's going to be starting for the Indianapolis Colts as a rookie, but tragically killed in an auto accident. And, uh, you know, the, the, the message on his headstone is this. His family's Christian. He was an awesome, strong Christian. Brandon was. Our loss is great, 
but God is greater. Our loss is great, but God is greater. Let us hold on to that news, that good news, in the face of all the tragedy that is now before us and will probably be before us in even greater waves in the coming days. So Samson took everybody with him when he died. Jesus died alone with everybody abandoning him that you and I might be saved and belong to God forever. In Sunday school today, we were talking about how Jesus died, that he, he tasted death. This is from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see him for a little while. He was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by grace of God, we might, that he might taste death on behalf of everyone. Jesus said, on the night before his death, he said this, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Christian, believe it. Go with Jesus. In the face of everything else going on, may your heart and soul, may your heart be given to Jesus and your life to him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you, and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.